Who knows? <laughs> Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, if you can hear us okay, would you please just uh, raise your hand so we can see that everything is working and If you can hear us, will you either raise your hand or feel free just to type something in the question mark or in the question box and let us know that everything is working good and you can um, hear us today and see us today. Oh, great. Thank you for responding. I'm like got a little worried there for a second. Okay. Um, so um, my name is Carrie and I'm here with Greg Hansen today. We are from Project Solutions. We're going to be presenting a um, presentation on job costing, providing essential information for basically any kind of profitable company. We've got construction, engineering, and trucking listed as examples. Um, as a disclaimer, we want to make sure you know that examples given are for illustration and could be different from what other companies are doing as far as pricing and bidding, but each firm has to decide what works best for them and use their own expertise and industry knowledge. Um, neither Project Solutions or the state of um, South Dakota Department of Transportation are mm -hmm. responsible for the firm's bidding success or lack of that may result as, from this training. Um, but we're going to do our best to give you a lot of valuable information. We encourage interaction and mm -hmm. questions as we go. Feel free at any time to type in a question and we'll get to it as soon as we can. Um, Greg and I were just talking before we started that he's done this class a lot of times. <laughs> Do you know how many? Oh my gosh. Um, I've been doing this, teaching this for 13 years, 14 years. So to me, the job costing is the holy grail and the Achilles heel of people in the construction engineering, anybody who does project based work. So. So it is kind of a passion for, for us as we do these trainings, yeah. So. And, and as we do it, we could, if we miss something or something doesn't make sense, just please bring it up. We'd love to address it at the time, but you can always reach out afterwards or later if questions arise. We'll also be posting this on the SDDBE website, so you can reference it at any point as well, which should be helpful. And I will email out to you after the presentation so you have easy access there. So let's get started with um, the important things. I hit the button twice. Okay, so our learning objectives for today. We're, we're gonna start out explaining what job costing is. Talk about contract, what contractors need to job cost in their business. What are job costs and what aren't job costs. Roles of various teams in your company. Calculating fully burdened labor rates. Tracking equipment and job labor costs to a job impact of change orders on job costing, pricing mistakes that we typically see, pointers to implement job cost practices in your business, and how to best use that job cost information. So I'm going to leave it up to you. <laughs> okay. Um, like I said, you know, as we write work on these curriculums the, the, uh, and worked with construction companies for uh, well, I guess starting in 2000, um, it's the accounting and the administrative part seems to be what holding them back. They they're always uh, pretty good at billing, doing the work that they were hired to do uh, along those lines. But uh, so that's kind of uh, we've evolved into the you know, really preaching on the job costing piece. And there's just a couple a uh, couple um, scenarios that maybe sound familiar to you or you've been in your your experience, you've seen some of these where jobs have done, you're not sure if you're on budget or not, or it's Monday and the crew doesn't really know what's going on that week, or you know, so they um, may, maybe aren't as productive. You know, you finished one job and you're using the cash from the next job to pay the job that you're just finishing. So, you know, that's, um, or, you know, the job's over, the company's looking good, you know, bills are paid, cash is left over. Um, it's certainly a good feeling, but is, is that is that what's uh, what's driving it? You know, so job cost reports will identify if your company's problem 
the job, it's job profitability, overhead, or some of both. And our little thing there where there's smoke, but I just can't find the fire. And, and that's why we say in project-based businesses, this component of job costing is often um, uh, the root of it. So, you know, and if you click on it, you click on it, uh, carry it out, yeah. none, none of the above can be addressed without without job costing. So. I would I would just add to like in talking to how many clients that we talked to what percentage don't do job costing and what difference it would wow, make because wow, I mean wow. so many people are not doing this so we can help you do this. Yeah, you, the you accounting have... right good 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 point you know the accounting becomes just a, a money tracker they don't they're using it to render checkbook and they maybe you know to pay the bills and do some payroll other than that it's really not being used as a tool so hopefully you can just a takeaway for you guys from this so. Um, part of the problem, you know, I think, is is the accounting profession does most of their work around taxes, and, uh, and this is an accounting. It's an accounting function, but only we found that 15% of accounting services are construction related. 5% is manufacturing, so it, it's it's a really a specialized profession. And uh, when you take, if you go to study accounting, I did a long time ago. I mean, you know, cost accounting was you know, that's that's what we're talking about is cost accounting. So um anyway so it's hard to find help it's hard to find help getting this stuff fixed um, so hopefully we can you know, provide some of that here here to, today so it's so programming your accounting software correctly at the outset is critical um we run into quickbooks the most maybe you're using something else so we'll we'll reference quickbooks in this and so uh, that we're not endorsing quickbooks or necessarily so it, give us if you're using something else uh, um, another right here, if you're making, if you have making notes to yourself here, getting buy-in from ownership, management, superintendents, all the way down to everybody, uh, this is essential because we'll get into talking about timesheets. So this involves everybody and you as the owner or the key people in the company, you have to walk the talk if this is going to be, if this is going to happen in your business and be successful. So, and why job costs, yeah, of course. You know, so, you know, how much money is spent on the project? You know, this is measure the job profitability at various stages of the project. Um, you know, mentioned, is it half done? Are we half, are we half on budget? Helps your estimators fine tune their processes. You know, so, you know, at the end of a project, you know, it doesn't feel right. You know, is it, was it a bidding problem or did, was it a performance or execution problem? So it would be very from the bid. You know, right? So are we accurate? You know, is we generating quality control problems. You know, so is it production rate? You know, a lot of different things so that, uh, um, Without it, it's, it's really hard to uh, attack some of these points. So, and the last one there, there's lessons learned on every project for sure. So, how about a definition? I guess um, job costing involves the accumulation of the costs, the costs, not the loaded up rate, just the costs of materials, labor, equipment, and overhead for a specific project. It uses a specialized type of accounting called cost accounting. Project management tool, if any of you study project management, it's just this is a key component of, um, of the PMBOK project management book of knowledge curriculum. Job cost information is accounting and, and an administrative function. Okay, as we mentioned earlier, requires coordination and communication between um, the office and, and the job sites. Uh, correct forming of the accounting ledger and software is the first step, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Technology provides many tools, but yeah, um, takes a company-wide approach, as I said before. So, um, job costs, money's paid for costs specifically for and attributable to a single project, with labor costs and the equipment, job materials, subcontractors, and so on. So, anyway, so that you know, back remember the the costs or the base wages. Not the loaded up rate. We're going to talk about how to load them up here in a little bit too. But so you want to have the direct cost of the workers, not their total paycheck, but just the wages attributable to that job. Um, this is done through how you track their timesheets. We're going to visit on some of those. Cost of equipment. We see companies that all their equipment is not put in as a job cost. It's 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 it's, it's, it's overhead. Which it is. If it's not being used, it is overhead. But they haven't. So the job cost looks really good, but they haven't accounted for the cost of the equipment that they've used. And I, I, we have some 
techniques here that hopefully you'll find useful that you can can do that. So, so job costs, um, you know, mobilization, field uh, field office expenses. Um, Want to make sure we mention um, uh, travel or per diem for your crews that are uh, out in the field. Question for everybody: Are project managers or supervisors a job cost, direct cost? How about bidding and estimating? You know, we've we've had uh, people. I spent a lot of money, a lot of time putting that bid together. Can I can I charge for that? And uh, usually, usually that that's an overhead item. So it is not um, not as you talk about uh, a job cost. Bidding and estimating is not same as supervision. And you know, in the in the industry. Now, you know, the people who project managers and super, supervisors on a project are overhead. Now, if you call a, a supervisor, uh, but actually they are a producer, they're leading a crew, maybe it would be considered a foreman. You know, the def definitive difference being if they have tools or not. So well, usually a supervisor is um, overseeing the project, coordinating with subcontractors on the job site. So it is, it is it is an overhead. To, so you're talking the same thing as some of your competitors. Let's look at you know, what's what what's let's talk about what what is a project versus operations. You know so um, click the, on the next slide. I'm sorry, the, the mouse hates me today. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, a project. You know so it's a you know a project has specific time frame. You know defined start and end date. You know it's, and unique end result, meaning what you complete is obviously is, is special, one of a kind, uh, has a budget of its own, temporary employees, you know, they're permanent for you on this project, their payroll is, is defined and they're temporary just to that project. But it's just, so it's a defined time frame to adjust if it's necessary. So it's, it's, it's critical in the, the length of the project to know where you're at so you can fix it, as opposed to an operations, um, you know, it's repetitive and there they have you know, there's no end date permanent staff. They have more chances to fix it than a than a project. So you know, they, but they each require a different record keeping process to measure the results. So operations, you'll think of a retail store maybe or um, I guess here we you know in project management. So um, anyway, so projects when you're doing projects, your window to make adjustments is is defined makes it a little tougher. As we say here, each one requires different record keeping process to measure the results. So let's 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 look at this little funnel we've got here. So so from the job site, we're getting a list of materials that are delivered. We're we're talking to the superintendents and the foreman. We're getting timesheets. We're tracking the equipment used on the job site. That information is being funneled to the office staff, and they're doing the billing. You're using the architectural um, industry documents or your your accounts payable, you're paying your vendors and your subcontractors, and over to the payroll department. All that's funneling together to create job cost information. So as we talk, so there's there's the job site piece and the office staff piece. And let's start on the accounting and office side. You know how you've set up the general ledger structure is where this all starts. Now, it's much like the foundation of a building that you're working on or whatever it is you're building. Having this foundation is essential. So, so step one, again, this is QuickBooks. So if you're not using QuickBooks, you know, this, the same things apply. The screens are, you know, the, the screenshots, you know, maybe not, but I think we see, I don't know, 90% probably. Yeah, and it's, it's quite possible if you're using something else, we can still help you. Oh, with it. totally, totally. So. Um, just, just a sidebar, you know, and I started a long time ago, uh, Peachtree, uh, which is now Sage, was the leader. You know, there was, and then Great Plains came on, and then QuickBooks came in and stole the show. And I think it's because it's easier to use. It wasn't necessarily because of price. Uh, we had met a, a company that had um, been using Great Plains, and to run a report was so cumbersome. I could see why. I don't think I could even do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and I thought, wow, no wonder QuickBooks stole it. Anyway, I, I, I digress, sorry. But so anyway, the screenshots you're going to see are QuickBooks, and if you're not using QuickBooks, we can help you with any of those, but the concepts are the same. So, so the step one in our job cost implementation is set up our accounting system. And the chart of accounts is the backbone of the accounting system, no matter what business you're in. 
So set up job costs, general ledger accounts as cost of goods sold. Now, if you bought QuickBooks and you created a chart of accounts based on a series of questions that asks you, these probably are not set up correctly. So we're going to talk you through this. So you're going to, in the little green bar there, you have, when you open up setting a new account, other account types, it says cost of goods sold. It's not in the default list. So you got to look for it a little bit. And here's a list of the accounts you're going to want to set up as cost of goods sold. You know, we call them job costs. QuickBooks or in the accounting world doesn't call it job costs. They call it cost of goods sold. So job labor, job materials, subcontractors, bonding, travel per diem, uh, the owned equipment use, equipment rental, small tools. Um, those kinds of things. You want to set those up as new accounts as a cost of goods sold in your system. You may already have these in, in, in some of, we've seen these where job materials or per, whatever title it has, but it's an expense. You just need to recategorize it using the edit account and move it to a cost of goods sold. Okay, so step one, your chart of accounts. Step two is create items. And, and this is a, a great technique that they have done. So while your chart of accounts can be pretty simple, items can be really lengthy. And you use these items to create estimates and invoices, and you map it to the appropriate general ledger account. Now you can, don't get hung up on the cost and price, you can change that for each, each customer, each contract. Um, also the type, there's a, a, quite a list of uh, that uh, QuickBooks will have. But the best one is just use service. Um, inventory, don't use inventory. And the items can be specific, job specific, or generic. And this one, this example, this one is concrete. Obviously, they could use this company could use concrete item on every project. And they, you can create the cost side and you can create the selling side. And you'll see the expense account as a drop down, and the income account, there's also a drop down. And you can define set those to hit or post to the general ledger accounts that we just talked about a minute ago. So items, you can use these to create estimates and then which ultimately will create invoices. And again, job specific or generic based on the kind of work you do, so. And if you wanna set up with cost, you can. Yep. And you can always edit them when you use them too. So it's not like it's, you have to go back to this later on. But if it changes a lot, it's probably not worth your time to set it up. But if it's a set fee, like a yeah, most of a, them, yeah, something like dumpster or something where it's always the same rate, or you right. you might want to set it. In order to get both sides of this to see the cost of the sales price, you need to click that little box that says the service is used in assemblies or is performed by a subcontractor or partner. So you have to click that. Otherwise, you don't see the, the cost side. But when you're setting this up, even if you later on don't use the cost side, click on this this click on that little box because it makes it easier to use and estimates later on. So, so that's step two. So step one, start of account. Step two is items. Now step three is payroll items. So you need to create appropriate payroll items, for each employee's profile. You know, there's a, you know, we've got the top there, we've got one called salary for administrative staff. And you look over to the right further, you see the account, expense account. And as you use these payroll items in generating people's paychecks, it's going to post their payroll based on those how it's mapped right there. So you can see, you know, the, the design, which is you see it starts with the six. That means it's an expense. It's not. It, it is not a job cost. The rest of them, well, masonry, plumbing, electrical, concrete, painting, roofing, carpentry, all begin with a five. That five two one zero. Those are job labor. That's their job cost category. You know, so and down there, um, supervision is not see it's, it is it is not um in that example i'm sorry it is it is a job cost in that example officers labor is an expense then they also have separated vacation and sick um, they post to operating expenses not a job cost back to how you look at some time sample timesheets here in a minute how so chart of accounts service items and then payroll items map to the correct uh, chart of account based on the type of payroll it is. Um, if you're doing Davis-Bacon work, um, these items can be set up, you know, reprogrammed so that um, whatever task that you assign to that person, the rate is correct based on the way the job is solicited. Um, 
we talked earlier about how you can create a template. So if you have a Davis Bacon or, or any, if you're going to hire 10 people for the construction season, you can create a template that will automatically populate the correct items in that person's profile. So, okay, so that's that's a really a um, high level view of the setup you need to do. You know, there's obviously there's some customization to it and we can help you with that. So, so you got three steps to set up your accounting system to start doing this. So the first, now we're gonna, let's start, let's, let's, let's talk about creating, how to create a new job. So um, first you wanna set up the customer and then set up add job. I mean, we've circled these, there's ghosts a little bit there, but so here in the example, there's um, Cruz Albert and there's several jobs that have been done for this cruise person. And then um, same thing with Shane Hambly. You see, we are, we're gonna create jobs under each of these customers. Quality bill construction, you'll see, which is the, the uh, this is the um, sample company in QuickBooks and see how they have set up jobs underneath this customer themselves. So this, you're gonna to wanna to do the same thing. Shop time, admin, bidding, client meetings, marketing. So those are the overhead payroll items that they've identified in their company and you'd want to do the same thing. So the rest of them were all customers and then jobs underneath. So you want to create the customer and then a job, even though they might be only one time, but it's easier to post to this, to that job. So, so now we've created a customer. Now let's talk about um, bills. So this is the enter bills. I encourage you to enter the bill same thing, there is also an option to enter credit card charges. And if you are using your credit card to buy materials, make sure you record them off of the receipt, not necessarily the statement, to get the right information. And here, the, the entering the bill where, in this example, we've chosen the customer of um, Heather Campbell, uh, new house construction. And the class, um, a lot of different ways you can use class. Uh, on the left is the item that we've set up, and this one is, and this is going to post to construction income when it's used, or cost of materials, landscaping materials, and this is for, uh, what fifty, I don't know, tons or hundred dollars a ton for some kind of uh, gravel or something. So for five thousand, okay. So enter the bills. Remember, um, have the superintendent or the project manager first approve the invoice. This is important. Have them mark the invoice for what the job is, what job it is, and the cost code to use. And uh, what do we say about the billable? The billable field is confusing. You know, everything that you buy is sort of goes to a project, right? It's going to be billed, it's going to be paid for by the customer, but not directly. It won't be imported into the invoice. So where that is just helpful is for service companies who make charges specifically for that item that can get pulled into an invoice. So our recommendation is that you click that off. You can set the preference that it will always default to off, but so. Unless you do a time and material job, it can be useful. Could be. Well, not many people do those. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so the next one is payroll. Um, um, you know, you're doing payroll is another training topic all by itself, but we want to show the steps you can do to, to job cost payroll. You know, each payroll item can have different hourly wages. We mentioned that before. Uh, Davis, Davis Bacon positions or laborer rates can also be pre-programmed. Fringe benefit rates can be programmed as a percentage of fixed dollar amount. So that's what these, we circle these. These are um, example that we're using from the QuickBooks sample company. Um, these are the fringe benefit rates. Um, so for masonry, for $22 an hour, that's programmed, the payroll will automatically add 17% um, for the fringe benefit. And if you've done Davis Bacon, you know it's always published or prevailing wage, those are, or union, those benefits are defined and you need to program them into the payroll items, makes it um, really easy to be compliant. And here we're setting up, this is a one particular employee, this is Chris Pepper. Um, seasonal staff, uh, what his classification is. And we just 
put all those items into his profile. Again, um, we, we mentioned uh, um, a template that you can create in QuickBooks that you can set these all up. And every time you hire somebody, you can pull this in and it's all, all there with the right rates. Really slick, really helpful. And you also want to use time data to create paychecks. We'll talk about time data and timekeeping here on the next slide. Well, this is the way it used to be. You would have an hourly sheet of the job site. On the left, the job name and duties, those would be already populated. What jobs, <clears throat> excuse me, can Chris charge to? Cruise house, Campbell house, shop or admin. Those are the only things that he would be able to charge his time to. Monday is eight hours at the cruise house. Tuesday is eight at the Campbell house. He had two hours in the shop. Admin on Wednesday for four hours, et cetera. So something like this um, is what we're used to seeing. This employee would fill this out. Foreman or superintendent would approve it and then go to payroll for payment. Well, you know, you have, the goal is to determine accurate job costs and the employee productivity, right? Um, we want to count the actual labor performed on a job site and filtering out everything else. But technology has made this kind of almost obsolete, I guess. You know, what's 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 changed um, is the um, way accounting systems can do this. You want to click the next slide, Terry? Yeah. So, you know, there's um, accounting systems can track job, job costs here. We've given some other references to um, Sage, which is, used to be Peachtree. Foundation is, a, is an excellent, but it's uh, much, much, much more expensive than, than QuickBooks. But um, you know, I encourage you not to use spreadsheets, you know, but by using the um, digital ways of tracking time, this payroll and hours worked has, changed, has benefited a lot. And the training is the key and set up. Uh, and, Notice, shout out here, for, or just a notice for people if you're using a payroll service. Now, payroll services have done a, a good job of promoting themselves. It's a good service for a lot of businesses, but um, sometimes in the payroll services, it's difficult to allocate wages to jobs and categories that um, payroll service can't do, and you end up doing to get a job costed, you end up doing everything but writing the actual check. Payroll services are a great fit for operation type businesses, restaurants, retail, wholesalers, but for project-based businesses like construction companies, we rarely see outsourced payroll used successfully. Something to think about. So if you're using a payroll service, um, if you're gonna grow, if growth or adding on to your staff is, um, you might, Think of yeah, doing something different. So, um, and if you have to do certified payroll, it's just so much easier. Also, I think than yeah, the yeah, services. Yeah, yeah. So, payroll services are, you know, like I said, you're, if you're to really get the right information, you end up doing everything except writing the check. I mean, the payroll service does the payroll, you know, do the payroll taxes, which is a convenience. But just, just like I said, in construction, we don't see it used much. Um, this is a uh, T sheets, which is a QuickBooks, it's now called Time. This is where either a smartphone or the superintendent or foreman can have a laptop where everybody can clock in on the laptop or their phone. And they're again their their profile would be programmed with the jobs they're working on. And they can post their time only to those specific items. It's really, really slick. Um, and it's it's not that expensive. You know, this is uh, QuickBooks, like I said. Um, whatever system you use, they require significant back office setup. Um, your people, like I said, it's programmed to only allow posting to jobs and tasks that they've been pre-approved to use. Easy to use, sync with QuickBooks, and it, uh, auto hours are automatically or electronically downloaded and ready for payroll into the timesheet. So. If you're using QuickBooks and you have, I don't know, I don't know, five, five to ten employees in the field, 
it's, you know, that'd be a good time to take a look at something like this. So it's, uh, I think we saw that it's a hundred dollars a month and then $2 per person per payroll. Don't quote me on that, but it was, no, it's not, it's not too bad, but it, it saves a ton. Taking all the entry is probably worth it. It saves a ton of time. Anyway, so when you get, when you get, whether you do it the manual way or import it through um, an app, you're going to end up with a timesheet that looks like this. And on this one, you see this is, we have back to our, our guy, Chris Pepper, and the week of 2025, I know QuickBooks sample companies at the moment. But you can see that, I mean, the dates on, he worked at the Campbell property, then he worked at the Cruz property, and he has some shop time. So that's how... And the service items are what you've programmed in the items and the payroll items that you want to, those are, if you're using the electronic version of time, tra time tracking, those are already in there. But if you're doing it manually, you're going to want to pick those, make sure you have the correct payroll item each time. Then it's time to create an invoice. Um, so we create an invoice. It's a, Again, do this when you do the work. So we see a number of businesses who don't invoice until they've been paid. Because sometimes the payment they receive is different than the invoice. So I, I, I encourage you to create the invoice at the end of each month or at the, at the end of the project. So here we got our project, the Campbell Heather House. Uh, the date, um, the bill to and ship to is auto populated. We're going to invoice for 100 this this gravel that we I think we bought it for $50. We're charging $75, and the invoice is $7,500 in this example. Um, sales tax in this example shows zero. Um, we probably shouldn't have sales tax if it's a unless we have an exemption certificate. Sales tax is a whole other class. We don't want to get off track, but what's what's taxable and what's not. So. Um, as we go through the accounting side now, we've, you know, we go through the steps of programming your QuickBooks and creating um, instead of payroll, entering bills, creating invoices. Let's talk about the, now let's, let's go talk about the, some of the things in the field. This is, this is a piece for the estimators. Um, often asked how to, how to calculate you know, labor rates. What's a fully burdened labor rate? So. You know, this is the actual cost of a company to have an employee, aside from the salary, all the benefits. You know, there's taxes, workers' comp, uh, paid holidays. I mean, there's health insurance, you know, bonuses, sick pay, so on. There's just a lot of things, right, of, of um, paying and keeping people and keeping them uh, incentivized. And, and so it's, you know, required by law oftentimes, too. So let's go through a few steps here to talk about how to calculate a fully Burden labor rate and what's 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 uh, we can roll. What if we can roll all these costs into a formula that we could use to for bidding? So we're gonna we're gonna show you a, a method to calculate a fully burdened labor rate that encompasses all the burden costs into one percentage. You know, everybody has their own way of doing this, and I often say if we had ten people in the room, there'd be ten different ways of doing this. So this may be a shortcut that could be useful. But by applying this percentage to direct labor or direct wages, it's an efficient and accurate method to put together a labor bid. You know, the thought about the labor burden, and you know, especially in a prevailing wage environment like Davis Bacon, your competitors have much the same problem you do, right? They're, they're looking at the same numbers. So when you say these rates seem awfully high or these benefits are high, your competitors have to pay the same one. So it's, it's not a differentiator in that regard. So what are, what, you know, what are some of the items and what are some of the components of labor burden? Payroll taxes, the employer side, right? Not, not the whole thing. Uh, state and federal unemployment. Um, you know, the uh, unemployment rate varies by firm depending on the history. Workers' compensation, same thing. And, you know, Employers share benefits, vacation pay, holiday pay, um, and then any contributions made to retirement plan. So let's let's go through some of these and different items and see how you would calculate 
uh, the burden in it for that. So uh, payroll taxes, right? again, so these are mandated federal law, 6.2, 1.45, federal employment is 0.08% of one, you know, 0.08 of 1%. Unemployment uh, varies in South Dakota. I think it's it's up to 50, the first $15,000 of a person's payroll. Um, you know, remember, personal income taxes are not a problem in South Dakota, but uh, um, any, any of those withholding garnishments, any of those deductions you make are not, a new, not an expense, right? They're, you're sort of the middleman of taking the money and remitting it to who it's supposed to go to. Let's say our, our guy, Chris Peppers, paid $21.15 an hour. We put those different taxes together. We put up, come up with $1.79 per hour for payroll taxes. So, so the next one, um, workers' compensation. You know, so that's another one. This is, you know, if we can come up with a way to calculate the rate, we can roll this into a percentage. Um, construction workers. Um, it's often dictated by the, the risk of the work. I think I saw that the lowest rate was uh, landscaping. I'm thinking because you're not on a ladder, you know, there's less chances. The highest was uh, the roofers are high, and then, you know, underwater welding or recovery was was high. So anyway, you add that percentage factor to each, each wage based to calculate the burden. The companies with lower loss ratios have lower premiums and less burden to pass on. So and we've seen we've seen quite a diversion. If people have had claims, their rate is markedly higher, which uh, makes it a little tougher for them to bid competitively. So let's for illustration, let's just say work rates work comp is five percent. Well, here we're going to add we're going to add that to our twenty one fifteen an hour, which is a dollar and six cents per hour for workers comp. And, and this for our illustration here. Now let's go to benefits. Um, a benefit that's bona fide is required by the Davis Bacon. You know, so paid holidays are vacation is PTO would be like sick pay, employer's share of health or dental or life insurance, uh, the employ employer's match of uh, retirement plans. So we want to convert these costs of these benefits to an hourly amount. Remember, um, we're doing a thing on um, coming up on um, human resources about. More benefits are being offered to only job workers in order to attract and retain a more stable workforce. So, just um, so something to think about as you look at if you want to, if you're going to add a benefit to your package uh, to attract employees, we're going to go through some methods here on how you convert that to what's that do to your hourly rate. So, okay. Davis Bacon is a fringe benefit, right? So whether you offered it in cash or not, um, it's got to be paid. But I'm going to show you how to convert. Maybe you do offer a benefit. Maybe you're having paid vacation over an illustration of uh, insurance premiums and um, how to convert that as a credit against the Davis Bacon wage. So. The example, let's say the Davis Bacon wages requires just two dollars and ninety cents an hour. And you have a plan that you pay employers fifty percent of the employers of the employees' premium. Let's say we're talking about Chris Pepper and his monthly premium is four hundred dollars or two hundred dollars a month to the company, because he's paying the other side. So two hundred a month times twelve is twenty four hundred dollars a year. Based on a full year's work of two thousand and eighty hours, that's a dollar and fifteen cents per hour. Davis Bacon says you need to pay two ninety, but you're paying a dollar fifteen. So on Chris's paycheck, there would be a dollar seventy five added to um, for the Davis Bacon fringe benefit payment because you're paying a dollar fifteen towards that in the, in the form of a bona fide benefit in, in in your health insurance plan. So so payroll taxes, we talk about payroll taxes, workers' comp, fringe benefit. Let's we put those together here. And um, talk about John Smith, who's a bulk concrete laborer. He's worked one year. Davis Bacon says it's twenty-one fifteen an hour plus two ninety in fringe for a total of twenty-four oh five an hour. Payroll taxes, remember, dollar eighty-four cents per hour. 
unemployment taxes are about 21 cents an hour. Health insurance and retirement plan, if we are example, if we've got, we're paying $10 a week for John's uh, retirement plan. So, so Davis Bacon's requiring 290 to the benefits the company's being offered. The company's paying a dollar 40 towards that. So a dollar 50 is due as cash. Dollar 50 is due as cash as an item, payroll item on his on his paycheck. So um, remember workers' compensation, although it's not a benefit, it is a, a direct cost attributable to job labor. And factoring it into this, this formula is very useful. You see our formulas there. In our example here, we this totals up to um, six dollars and sixteen cents an hour of labor burden for this for this person. We divide that by the um, hourly rate he's being paid. That's thirty percent labor burden, and so if we add that, so that's six dollars and thirty-five cents per hour, um, and we would. We would charge twenty-seven dollars and thirty-one cents for every time we burden use this person's hourly rate. Then, after you do this, then add the overhead and the profit. So, so why is it twenty-one fifteen times the thirty percent and not twenty-four oh five times thirty percent? It's because the fringe is already rolled into the burden rate. You know, we do these calculations after each construction season annually at a minimum. So remember, so we're, the burden is the 30% includes the Davis Bacon and then the 25th times the 2115 in this example. Okay, then add overhead and profit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we see a lot of companies who don't have a mechanism to calculate or, or to use job costing the equipment that they own. Okay, so how do you equitably do that? You know, are, you're, you're using rates that are appropriate or accurate. So if you're renting or leasing equipment that doesn't apply because it's easy to assign those costs as the payments are billed or paid. So this is, this is going to require a lot of coordination between people on the job site and your bookkeeping. Now another you know, step by step we'll, we'll go through here. Here you need to create a billing rate or bidding rate for your own equipment. And this is a, some sample equipment. And then how you want to bill it. Do you want to do it as you do bid it on a monthly rate or a weekly rate or by the mile, et cetera. So you want to create a sheet like this of the equipment you own and how you're going to charge it all out. Okay. That's the first step. You know, and then step two is create an overhead account and call it equipment. And we would recommend that you put all of these types of accounts under this new overhead account called equipment. Fuel, repair, depreciation. Um, if, you have a, if you have a maintenance shop or a garage, is one. The mechanics wages, if you have a mechanic. Um, all this goes into a bucket. What do we call, I call it? Buckets. So, so it's all pooled there. And then as bills come in and they're paid, they're all hitting these accounts. And you're creating this one large bucket of equipment costs. Okay. And step three is creating a timesheet, much like an employee for each on each project and for a new sheet each week. So here we have the XYZ project and um, this is a template that we would use again and again. Um, much like, like, looks like an employee timesheet that's gonna be used for equipment, okay? Next one, let's see more, for some illustration on the XYZ. Uh, we have the Smith project, we have a loader, we have a, a truck, we have a skid steer. And you know we're using the daily rate, and the equipment trailer. We're using a weekly rate. These are just for for illustration. You know, it's, each one's going to be different. So, so this on this for the week of Monday through Sunday, there was six thousand nine hundred and forty dollars and sixty cents of job costs for your equipment company on equipment applied to the Smith project. Okay, so this this the the, the Bookkeeping department would record this entry and charge six thousand nine hundred forty dollars to the job, and then they reduce the overhead. I hope you can see at the end of the year or the end of the month, any time frame, are the jobs paying for the equipment, or are you over allocating? Are your rates too high? So there's a lot to be learned 
by doing this if you follow this so are your, are your rates appropriate so um we've been asked oftentimes uh, trucking company to help what's my cost per mile so we came up with this just a little um method to do that we've done this and, and so um you need to know the number of miles driven in a period and talk to a number of trucking companies they have this you know so they have they knew how many miles each truck had driven or number of hours you know depending on what it is and using this cost bucket method we talked about and again you total up all those accounts and divide it by number of miles or hours during the period and you can add your overhead rate and your profit to it to get a rate to charge customers so i guess it's really just taking all the costs if you've got this information it's pretty straightforward how much you spend all year on um, equipment and divide it by how many miles or hours and you get a cost per mile once you've done this here's an example and if you can read this report you know once you're doing job costing in your accounting system you get some just powerful information this is the you know the estimate versus actual for a job using our quality built construction yeah. they'd estimated seventy five thousand six hundred dollars in cost actually it was eighty one thousand uh, a little over the revenue is you know they estimated at hundred thirteen thousand but that's all they can charge is hundred thirteen thousand so in this example they made about six thousand dollars less um, than they thought um, this is, you know, change orders can impact your reporting. Was this resulted? Did we do work that wasn't part of the original contract? Why, why did it go over six thousand dollars? So, if you're buying the QuickBooks contractor version, there is a change order function to uh, update project costs and revenues to estimates. So that, you know, this is to be that close. I guess is not that big of a deal. But if if it was a change order, did you do some work that wasn't part of the original project that could flag a change order? So. So, so from also, so the, um, the job cost information on a profit loss statement is, you know, is the biggest opportunity for improvement to your bottom line. You know, you know this is the overhead, so the blue frame is the overhead section, but it's necessary to support projects. But if you can, if you can save 5% on overhead, it's not gonna be the same as if you could five, save 5% 5 or improve your productivity by 5% in a job cost. So. And so yeah, and these are these are some reports that are specific. So on the left is um, multiple jobs. This is the summary. And on the right side is the the detail. So report lists all jobs, revenue and cost to date, gross profit. You can see that over the far right at the bottom it says they've made three hundred one thousand nine hundred ninety six dollars divided by the revenue of eight hundred twenty thousand. They're at thirty seven percent gross profit. If you had the estimates done, also we'd know what was the plan gross profit. Are we planning for 40 or are we planning for 30, et cetera. So, and here's just one particular job detail. This is just, so the left report is the summary of all jobs. And we, I think we can see that this job of, uh, that we're looking at the detail on is um, shown there also. But here in this example, this job, they made 135,000 gross profit of, on the revenue of 325,000, 42%. Okay, so if you're doing your job costing, this is the kind of information you know, you, you'll be able to get. Uh, mistakes. In estimating, counting the cost in both overhead and job cost. So we went through how to calculate a totally burdened labor rate. Well, you want when you look at your overhead rate, you want to pull those out. Make sure your those are not part of your part of your um, overhead rate because you already counted them in the already counted them in the, your Davis Bacon or fringe in your labor burden. Okay, everything but the kitchen sink is the job cost. You know, I use the example of a guy had to buy a generator. He has four thousand dollar generator, and he was going to put that as a job cost. I said, well, let's just use a you know that's got a five-year life and you're gonna use it for five months 
you should break that down into monthly how much you're going to charge for it. Even though you need to go buy that generator, if you put that whole generator in there, you might not you might not win. Another one is charging all workers hours as job labor. Remember to filter out, separate out, you know, overhead shop or safety training, stuff like that, or holiday pay, stuff like that. You want to only account the wages that are attributable to the job. Also, charging too much for equipment used on a job. You know, if you're using our calculator that we showed you, you might find out that you're that you are. You know, and you'll learn a lot by using it. So another one we see is underestimating mobilization costs. And from the time there's do we want to contract until the time we start actually working, there's a lot goes on there. And sometimes that number is too small. And any other ideas, anybody that we, that we job costing mistakes that, that um, I think and also not understanding, you know, we've heard small businesses will say, XYZ company bid that below cost. Or, they bid that below my cost. I don't know, how can they possibly bid that? You know, there is some discussions there, you know, what is, you know, there is large companies can, they have lower, cost per unit than a smaller company. And there's some some legitimacy to that, but you know, you know how you look at your costs, what the industry costs are, and that's another discussion. And when you, know, if you need help or want to talk about that, we can do that. But when you say the winning bid was below your cost, there's something, some, something there that you know, they're, they don't stay in business by, um, by working below cost. I will tell you the gross profit. If you're a prime contract, general contractor, their margins are at, you know, you know, 10, 12 percent, but they're doing a high, high volume, right? So something to think about. So that if you're if you're if you're losing a lot and you're wondering why your indirect rates, your market rates could be could be need to look need to look looking at closer, I think. So Uh, a few pointers. Um, talked about general ledger accounts are set up to separate costs, job costs from overhead. Uh, project estimates for cost, markup, and revenues entered into the accounting system. We saw some sample reports. You get the right labor codes, wage rates, um, multiple payroll items for employee. You know, so. Um, You know, how to you know, track your own equipment time. Um, use um, receipts. You know, we have people who are synchronizing their QuickBooks with their bank and they're importing transactions. Discourage you from encourage you to to not do that for your business. You want to have the receipt or the some kind of a documentation. Um, this is if you're using QuickBooks. Um, there was a report under under um, job costing that's called um, expenses not charged to jobs. It's a very cool, at the end of the month, you think you've been pretty good about it. Run that report and see if you missed something. You know, keep a job profitable, make sure they, make sure they know their work schedule and uh, track labor hours by task, sure. Um, because the whole idea of job costing folks is, you know, of all the money I spend, how much of it is overhead and how much of it is job cost? The more you can, if you can, if your overhead is too high, then now you know. If the job costs are not what you think it should be, now you know. That's the, I think we're, uh, you know, sound like we're overthinking this, we're not, but that's, that's really, that's the, the objective, right? Is to um, know what part of your company is working and what part of it isn't, you know, so. Prepare now. Yeah. So the setup, getting getting the whole team behind it, that is essential, and uh, um, can't emphasize that enough. It's 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 part accounting, but it's you need people in the field to give you the information that you need to do this. And sometimes people in the field are, you know, they're they're busy. They say, oh, you know, I don't, you know, I have receipts in the bottom of the truck, it's full of mud, or you know, that's just not. But you've got to. You can't let that let that happen. So, so the information is powerful, and um, I think you'll start to see how you can bid better and how to manage better. 
How, if you have superintendents, how do you tell them they're doing a good job if you don't have this information? So, time and effort pays for itself. It does. Once you set up, get the routine going, it does itself. It's not. It's not a. It doesn't take much time. So, if it's you know, if you think it seems daunting, it's really not. It's just. It's just your processes. Then, you know, your system set up and your processes. If you have any questions, um, you're welcome to submit them on, on here or um, email. We on the next slide. I think we have our, there's our emails. Glad to answer any questions. We get we're kind of a help desk hotline sometimes where people, yeah. um, a guy called me about sales tax. Okay, so we can, you know, another person about is this, you know, how to, is it how to, job cost a truck that the superintendent drives. So whatever, you know, it is, if it's a you know, QuickBooks, we can help you with that as well. So hope you got some things you can use. Um, much success to you in 2021 and beyond. And thank you for tuning in. Yep. Thank you very much. Have a good day.